Okay, so now we're good. Um, so this is this is all recorded as of now, so no we have been extremely like that. Uh, there, up there, the back. Um, so the first thing we're gonna do is go through the, if there's any questions on the quiz. So let's just pull up the quiz. Anybody, any questions on the quiz? Remember the, the new paradigm is, I'm not going to go through all the questions in the quiz, I'm just going to say, if you have a problem with the quiz question, any one of them, let's go through it. If not, we're going to go on to the class itself. Anybody, any questions in the other 10 questions over there? Anybody? They're all straightforward. So as I scroll down, Janice, tell me which one you see is the one you want to talk about, okay? You see it? Too far, too far away? Yeah. Too small? This is tough. I'm doing it upside down. Sorry. Following consequence to maximum, minimum. This one to break? Okay, if the maximum election is taken on an asset with an accrued gain at the beginning of the year end, the B proceeds to this disposition are equal to fair market, fair market value. So remember, the maximum election is always going to be your fair market value number. Right? So that's the way the formula works. Remember the formula we do? Is, I'm going to write this on the board. It's pretty straightforward. It's in the book. Where are my markers here? There. Okay, what's the what's the what's the parameters of 11, 111, 4 a Do you remember? For the election amount, what is that? Anybody remember? What are the parameters? And again, in eighteen months, when you're doing the course uh, four sixty two, four sixty three, whatever that number is, you're going to be rollovers. So you're going to get used to seeing exactly these sorts of things in order to. Professor Mark and I were talking about this exactly the same way as doing the election. Can we remember what's the election? What's the amount you can determine, Jennifer? Um, it's the rest of the fair market value or the um, greater of the adjusted cost base. Um, Remember that? That's in the book. The nice thing about this, well, that's today. No midterms today, I guess. Huh? Because I felt slighted the other day. You guys have a midterm and I just get blown up. So the elected amount of 111.4e. Remember, 111.4e deals only with capital property. You cannot elect on an inventory item. Okay, even if inventory is down by a million dollars, how fly? So remember when you, I was going to write a quick question on this, but I was looking to the answer now. Remember, if somebody has business and all they do is flipping land and land has about a cost of a thousand dollars and it's gone up to a million dollars but it's a it's not capital property it's inventory you cannot elect on that land so that question we remember that issue we dealt with a few weeks ago on inventory versus capital you can only elect when you want to let on capital property everybody get that so if your if your land is inventory uh, you, you lose that you lose that argument on whether or not it's income versus capital i.e it's income you cannot elect on that property as well either Right, let's say. So take a look what happens here. So the elected amount on a capital property is the lesser of fair market value. That says to you, fair market value is the cap. So matter, no matter what happens here, if you want to choose an elected amount of $10 million, guess what? The act has, I'm missing another couple of zeros, right? Guess what? If the, if the fair market value is $1,000, you cannot elect more than $1,000. You can't create income that doesn't exist. Right? You don't have a limit to gain, you can't do that. And then the other one is the ACV. Right? So the greater of the elected amount. So basically, if you look at this, the elected amount is the number you're picking. So what you have is the lesser of fair market value and ACV, where you, you have a window. So you pick a number between ACV and your fair market value. That's your window. The upper end is fair market value, the lower end is ACV. Everybody get that? Yes, 
then you don't have an election. You're, you're actually not upset. You're being forced to realize the loss. Oh. Remember? Okay. I mean, that's the nice thing about it. This can only happen because you're not going to get to the other way. Remember, the acquisition and control rules say if you have an accrued loss, pregnant loss, late loss, unrealized loss, all that kind of stuff that they like to call it, any of those things that says, I have a loss, you have to recognize it. Guess what? You can't have it because fair market value is irrelevant because you've already, you've already been hit by the, the realizing of the loss. You can't make an election on that same asset. Okay? What else? Any other quiz questions, guys? Again, you know what? The quizzes are meant to be very high level, but also to make sure you understand the core concepts. If one of these 10 questions you don't understand, you should ask because they're really, really fundamentally basic questions. Lisa says, I don't understand what they're asking for. Yeah? Uh, number four, number nine. Number four. And number nine. After the deemed year triggered by an and control, the corporation next year end can be any day chosen in the next 53 weeks. Right? So basically, you can, when you have an acquisition and control, normally you don't get it. It's a day that just happens because you have a business deal, right? It doesn't normally happen on the normal year end. So if you have a December 31st year end, Right? You're not going to, generally speaking, you're not going to have your acquisition control that day. The, the odds are very low, and it might happen. But generally speaking, it's going to be some other day of the year. That other day becomes a normal tax year. You have to file the tax return, right? You have to do all the stuff you normally do for filing the tax return on that day, for that day. Okay, six months after you have to file the return, all that kind of good stuff, right? That, 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 that start, that new tax year, anytime after 53 weeks, you can pick a new year. Whatever you want. Okay? So what happens is you pick whatever you want. Most people, what they do is by the December 31st year end, they go back to the December 31st year. The reason is, there's probably a reason why they have December 31st year. Right? You know, whatever the reason it is, seasonality or whatever the business. There was a reason you like December 31st. Most people go back. But you can't wait all the way up to 53 weeks. The only the reason it's 53 weeks there is because the maximum length of the tax year is 53 weeks. Okay? You can actually have 53 week years. Anybody know when, when that happens? How, that, how does that happen? A lot of businesses they use every Sunday, every Saturday as their as their month end, or as their month end. So they'll go four, they'll go four weeks, or five weeks, four weeks, four weeks, five. And what happens is every three years you have to catch up on a missing week, right? Because they catch up on Sundays and Saturdays. So you can have a 53 week year. Okay? So that and then the government says, okay, we'll let you have 53. You can't have a 200 week year, because generally speaking, that means you don't get an income tax for a long time. So that's why they kind of say, okay, no more than 53 weeks because of that. Okay? Andrew, and you said eight? Number nine. Nine, sorry. In order for non capital loss carry forwards in existence at the deem year to be deductible against income in future years, the income must be generated by, okay, remember? What are the conditions? The big, the big thing with the acquisition control rules are they, the government wants to stop people from doing what? Why are they there? Just so that, like, for example, people are hiring businesses who are using their losses against their like, right. property. You have businesses out there that lost money for a few years, and they had $10 million of losses, right? The, the business is worth zero, but they have $10 million of losses. They're even shell companies. There are no operations left. Guess what happens? People go and say, OK, I'll buy that from you. And the losses are worth a million dollars to me. So they give them a million dollars. As far as the government's concerned, that was just a transaction between people that had nothing to do with the business and, and trying to create jobs in the Canadian economy and stuff like that. They don't want people doing that. So what they say is, if you're not going to have that business going forward and actually generating, you know, employment in Canada and all that stuff, we're not going to let you basically get money for what you lost. Right? <laughs> so the rules are what are the what are conditions of deducting non-capital losses after an acquisition and control. Okay. Right, so you have to, okay, so that's that's what they're applied against, but there's two conditions before that, okay, do you remember? The business has to be carried on throughout the year, right? So the lost business, so the one that we, remember we just, I just said, if it's a shell, is the lost business carried on? No, so automatically you're out. So they don't want they don't want people doing that kind of stuff. So Katie, the first thing is the lost business is carried on throughout the year and it's the lost and one deducted. Okay? Number two is not only is it carried on, but it must be carried on with an expectation of profit. Right? Again, you know what? What you do is 
people are smart people out there. What they'll do is, I'll carry the business on. Now I have a bakery, I'll sell one donut in the year. I carry the dot, so you got to carry it on throughout the year, but you also have to carry it on with an expectation of profit, right? Because otherwise, you know, if there's ten million dollars in losses, somebody will kind of do something, hire some, you know, minimum wage person to sit there and sell donuts, lose twenty thousand, but they got to the deduct ten million. So you have to be able to carry on the business throughout the year, and secondly, has to carry it on with an expectation of profit. Because people were smart enough to say, okay, I'll have to just carry it on. I'll, I'll be goofy around. I'll, I'll do it, but I won't make any money here. I've got bigger losses that I've already acquired. Yeah. So what if they just want to acquire a business for one particular portion, either uh, I don't know, patents or something like that? Losses. Um, yeah, they're acquiring a business that has a built up losses, but uh, they're not. They're basically not carrying on the rest of the business, but they're carrying on a certain you have to carry on the business. So, and again, remember we always talk about the importance of what a business is. A business means you're regularly doing things. You're buying, selling, you're, I mean, that's what the courts have said. So what you just said, if it's just a patent and they bought a patent and you don't do anything else, I would, I would, I would think, no, you're right, this is correct, right? So and it's just because the policy objective is whatever created the loss should carry on, right? You should be able, whatever, whatever was creating that loss, there are people in Hawaii that are doing things and stuff like that. The government doesn't want people just to kind of do financial transactions for losses. And the way they do that is say, you gotta carry the business on, and you gotta carry the business on to uh, with an expectation of profit. Then what you do is you get the key, what Katie just said is, then you can deduct those losses. So you have to get through those two doors before you can say, what are they applied against? Okay? You have to do that two-step process. Do I meet the preconditions? If yes. How much can I apply against them? Against what? It's against the lost business, remember? And uh, similar businesses, sort of. So if you're selling donuts and you want to and you start selling cookies, you're probably okay. Like if you're selling donuts all of a sudden renting cars, I would submit that it's not going to be okay. Right? So it's got to be the same or similar business that you're deducting those losses against. Right? The reason why they put the similar business in there, because what happens is sometimes the only way to get the losses used is to put it together with something else that has more um, uh, quantity, more, more sort of critical mass to it to make the business profitable. So basically the government say, if you can figure out ways to make money from this process, we'll have, we're, we're okay with that. But if, if that business has to carry on in its, in its previous state, and you can augment it, do things around it. And there's, there's smart things you can do with capital structure and stuff like that to help it. Management changes, all that kind of stuff. But the loss business must be carry on and just carry out with an expectation of profit. Then you can say how much do we use against there as Katie was saying. Okay? There's a two-step process. Okay? Is that good, Andrew? Okay, we're gonna talk about that a little bit today. Okay. This stuff is um, it's a real pain. I have done one of these uh, a few years ago. It was um, British Petroleum, I don't know if you guys know a very, very big company. And they sold out a lot of different businesses at one point in time. And we had two hundred fifty million dollar business had this. You have to look at all your assets. You have to appraise all your assets. You have to do all that stuff. You only talk about fair market value here. It's a nice concept, but you have to go out and go and do it, right? I mean, and sometimes when British Petroleum is selling a $10 million deal up here, a Canadian company of $200 million, all they said was value the Canadian business at book value. So they didn't even do any appraisals. So we have to go and do all that stuff. So when, they, when we talk about these rules, they're a pain in the butt, they are. Right? They are, but that's, this is the way the government's way of, of preventing people from uh, cheating the system. The, the funny thing about this, sometimes this hurts the government, right? How does, how does the acquisition of control rules actually hurt the government sometimes? No, 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 I don't think so. I, I, I think, you know what, if you're smart enough, you can, you're, you're here to do a transaction with artists, you'll be able to make those rules work. Okay. And, I mean, you could argue that sometimes companies get afraid because they're not going to meet those rules. A good tax advisor will tell them how to consider it. Okay? I, I would, I've never seen a transaction not happen because of it. Like, why would this, where's the situation where the government, the acquisition control rules actually don't work the way the government probably intended? What if there are losses? What if you have a business that's making money, paying tax, and all of a sudden, and they've got a bunch of old stuff on their books that's not worth anything? What do these rules do? What do these rules do? Everybody's at fair value. Yeah, they're basically, they're going to tell this company, you can, you got to realize all those losses on your old equipment and stuff like that. You were still using, but they're worth nothing, right? Effectively, guess what happens? 
You have big terminal losses, big write downs. You have a big loss, you carry it back, you get your taxes reduced for previous years. I've, I've seen that. At one company, we had big huge refunds. It was never the intention of the rules, but they can't change, they can't say, oh, well, it's only if you're losing money that these acquisitions are controlled. Well, I guess they could write that, but they didn't. So there are times when the acquisition of control rules actually generate cash for the company. Because you file a big giant return refund returns. Don't forget, they will come out at you, and they did. They will come out at you because as soon as you file a big, big loss, and they're going to say, what happened? And you get a bill through and stuff like that. Okay? So most of the time, these rules are meant to stop people. But Jason, what I was trying to get at is there are occasions where people are making money paying tax. And these rules say, oh, look, that, that building that was worth, you know, that you bought the $10 million a couple years ago, something happened, it's worth 50 cents. You take the terminal loss right now. You write it down. Right? Or not terminal loss, but you take the CCA out. Okay. Right? Is everybody good on that? So there are situations, in, and these, these rules are really a pain in the butt if you're doing it. If you're, if you're, if you're a public accountant, they're great, because you get the bill like crazy. Because you know, there's so much complexity, you just show them all the work you did, you need the bill for it. So they're, they're good for accounting firms as well. Okay. Anybody else on the quiz? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I just wanted to clarify, so non-negotiable assets can be used to recognize accrued gains. Yes. But uh, for the question, we And depreciable assets, too. And, and Capital assets, right. only capital assets you can be the election on, okay. not inventory. Okay, is it, because uh, for question three it says the following are mandatory, so is it? Here, this question three? Uh, yes. So I actually checked off uh, uh, all accrued gains on non deficient assets, so is that not recognized? Question three, which of the following are mandatory when there is acquisition control? Retained earnings, nothing. All accrued losses and assets are deemed realized. So all losses are realized, right? So inventory or not, you still have to do all losses, right? So any losses, you get beat up, right? All accrued gains on non depreciable properties are realized. They're not all realized unless you elect them to be. You have to elect. So there's not, it's not automatic. The losses are automatic. The gains are elected using that formula, OK? There is a deemed year end, which we know about. Property loss carry forward expires, which we know. Donations carry forward expired. All depreciable assets have their UCCs reset, which is not true to their fair market value. That's not true. Either. Okay. So you've got depreciable assets that are not that. Okay. Everybody good? Anybody else on the quiz? We're going to do this. We're going to do all ten. I suspect we're going. Anybody else questions on the quiz? Okay. On the read. Anybody have any questions on the reading itself? So the stuff you read on acquisition of control and all that stuff. Anybody have any stuff you read inside to get that? No? Okay. So let, let's get into the question. Um, it's a lengthy question. What I'm going to do is, is take you through uh, the process that I would go in, in real life. And, and it's probably better than the marketing key, but it'll, it'll make sure that you get everything you need uh, to understand this stuff. Okay? Just make sure when you read a question on these things, you'll see the question on Thursday. Is a previous exam. Read what they ask you to do. Don't do a lot of stuff that they don't ask you to do. Okay? So if there's an acquisition and control question and they only ask you for one little thing, do the little thing. Don't do everything. Okay? So the question on Thursday, the, the, uh, the problem is an old midterm. There's two questions there. And, and you'll see some of this is you can run out and do a bunch of stuff or you can actually do it just, just what they ask for. Okay? Guess what happens when you do the former? You get a lot of zeros. You do the latter, you get the marks. Okay? So pay attention to what you're asked for because these rules, you'll see today there's an awful lot of stuff going on. Only do what you're asked to do if there's a question. Okay. Are we all done with the signing, guys? Is that good? Is that size okay? You guys can read it at the back? You guys can read it okay? I'll try to write reasonably legibly today. All right, so I will put the problem up here. Okay, so 11.3, there's the top. Okay, we're gonna go to the required. Okay?
Yeah. Okay. So what do you do here? So hang on, let's take a look. Prepare an analysis of the income tax implications of the acquisition shares. In your analysis, consider the two election options from which the election. Okay? So the election stuff is part of your analysis, not the only analysis, right? Okay? When you read that, it says prepare an analysis and then talks about the election. So the elections is one specific element you want to look at. So if you just talk about the elections, guess what? You missed a lot of arms. Right? Just look at the sets. Prepare an analysis of the income tax implications of the acquisition. Shares. Okay? So sorry, I went So how are we going to address this? So I wouldn't jump to the I wouldn't jump to the I would not jump to the uh, elections first. Okay? Because then you've missed half of the stuff. Um, so the first question would be the Okay. So what's the first thing? As soon as you see acquisition of control. But if you say, what are you going to tell your client? What are you going to tell the marker? If you see acquisition of control, what do you think happens? Uh, there you go. There you go. So the first thing is you have a dean year end. Right? If you do not write down acquisition of control equals dean year end, you have a lot of trouble. You missed a lot of marks and you're probably not going to have a job very well. That's pretty fun then. Okay? So good. So you have an acquisition of control, you have a dean year end. Okay, and when is that year end? Uh, right, immediately before the acquisition of control, so the day before. Okay, what else? Uh, I'll go write down some stuff in a few minutes. Okay. And then, so it said, this tip was that it decides to sell some information. Okay. So they've already told us there's acquisition control, so you don't need to say, you don't need to define the acquisition of control, right, Ben? Oh. They, they already told us, take a look. Tell us what happened. Tell us about the implication of the acquisition, acquisition of control. So don't spend paper telling us there's been an acquisition of control. We told you, we told you there is one. You're just going to get it to. Now that there's an acquisition of control, there's a dean here in, uh, immediately before, the day before, the, the acquisition of control. Okay? That means you're going to file a tax return, okay? Do six months after the, uh, the date of the acquisition of control. What else are you going to say? What else are you going to say? Okay. You know what? I'll, I'll help them on this stuff, and then, and then I'm going to take you up from the back of the election. Okay? okay? So we have a dean year end immediately before tax returns are filed. Because when did the acquisition control happen? March, what's the day? March something? June? June, June, June. So, uh, it's a short year. Therefore, you're going to prorate things like CCA. Okay? These are all things you're going to just know automatically. You're going to tell your client. So tax return. You have to file six months later. There's a short year end. That short year counts as a year, like all the others from last care for That's four or five marks that automatically when I hear acquisition control, I know I'm going to tell people. Right? Because it's good for them to know this, because guess what? Especially if you're in public accounting, that all means money. You're going to file tax returns. i got to do this, i got to do this, i got to do that. It all means you're going to be able to charge them in a way that they say, yeah, okay, that makes sense. You told me about that up front. Okay? Is that fair? Okay, so those are the those are the um, administration stuff. Then, then we're going to get into the numbers in the sound. Okay. So everybody got that? So overall implications of acquisition and control. Okay, henceforth, AOC, okay? So whenever I say the rest of the, if I'm writing something, I write AOC, that means acquisition of control, okay? For this lecture. Number one, deemed year end immediately. You remember, this is gonna be online in a tape, so don't, I wouldn't spend a lot of time writing stuff because it's all gonna be there. So write what you think you need to know that I, either you can't read or you, you don't understand what I said. Deemed year end immediately before Acquisition, <laughs> i.e., June 30. What year is it? Uh, 11? 11, yeah. Okay. I'm going to file 
tax returns within six months of deemed year end. Three, year end is less than full year. Therefore, uh, prorate deductions like CCA, right? What else do we got to do? What else did I say? You have a uh, deemed year end, you're filing tax returns, you got prorate deductions like CCA. There's a fourth one, what was the other one I said? Oh, uh, the, the short year counts as a, as a year for lost carry forwards. The short year counts as a year for loss carry forward use utilization. Okay? So those are four things you can automatically say. Kitty, what were you getting to understand, Kitty? Year end is, is less than full year, therefore prorate deductions like CCA. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. So if you can't read a word, just throw your hand up, okay? Okay. That'd be good. So that is the basic background stuff. So that we call that administration <coughs> overall stuff. Now we can get into okay, what what happens to the dollars and cents of the tax return? The rent, so what's gonna happen? One more point number five, and then, and then Rand will help us do the numbers. Okay, number five. All accrued losses to date of acquisition of control must be realized. Okay? So we're gonna, now we're going to do determine taxable income loss for short year. Okay? So this is step number two. What did I do? A? What did I do? A? Okay, so we're going to tell the client, step one, here's some overriding stuff. Step two is, okay, we're going to file a tax return. So obviously the tax implications are, what's a taxable income for the year or loss? Okay, Red? So what is that? Sorry? Pardon me? Sorry, what? So now you said you're gonna realize the losses and stuff like that? You're gonna do that in the context of, of what? In, in, in the context of preparing a tax return, right? right? Determining the losses doesn't mean anything until you put it in somewhere. So I think the easiest way to do this is to, to go through a process, okay? This is what happens. Now let's do the tax return. All I'm doing in my mind is, is doing what I would do in real life. You would do the tax return, and then I would spit out losses, and then you would tell what happens to losses and what happens to the cost base going forward. Does that make sense? Because you can chase your tail a little bit on these things if you don't look, you go through the process. So the way I would always do these things is tell the overriding what's going to happen. Next, let's do the tax return. That'll tell us do we have losses this year or not, and if so, how do we do the deal with it going forward in addition to the losses we inherited? Then that's going to tell us what our go forward positions are in terms of losses and cost basis. And then we're going to go back and say, oh, that kind of sucks. We have an election. And if so, what are the two types of elections they'd ask about? And you're going to do the same thing doing the two types of elections. Okay. And I think if you do it that way, there's, there's some intuitive logic to it. And then at the end, we can then compare the three choices and look and say what happens. Okay. So, Ren, if, if I ask you to prepare a tax return in this course, you're not, you don't have a computer and a tax court thing. What, what would we do? How are you going to determine taxable income? Uh, we start with 3A. Good, good. Um, okay, so hang on, Ren. Last class, a lot of you weren't here, but make sure you go through that stuff because when we say determine taxable income or net income for tax or whatever you want to say, you need to go through the ordering provisions. So remember back at the beginning of the course, I said ordering and sourcing is two very important things. <coughs> ordering is uh, as determined by section 3. So in the last class, we go through how the rules in section three tell you A, B, C, D, E, F, 
what taxable income is, or net income for tax purposes is. Make sure you understand that, because if you don't do it, you're going to miss marks, just because guaranteed you're going to screw stuff up if you don't do it in a certain order. Okay, so you're going to do it in basically 3A, 3B, 3C that we did. Is that fair? So Ren, very good. So what do you got? Okay, remember 3A, what 3A says, and again, if you weren't here the other day, um, go online and do that lecture. It was a, it was a, a very, it was a very good lecture in terms of understanding this stuff. And I tried to go slowly and explain stuff the way it works and um, brought up the provisions and everything like that. 3A deals with positive amounts. Okay, so you're only dealing with things that are good in your P&L. So income from business and property, and uh, income from employment. This is a company, therefore you don't have employment. In this case, as Ren says, we don't have it. Okay. Now, what are you going to do then, Ren? Okay, TCG, taxable capital gains. Okay. Yep. Hang on, hang on, Ren. Don't do elections yet. Okay. Okay. What I want to do. What you would do in real life is you're going to probably do your tax returns without the elections. You're going to say, this is what the rules are, this is where we are, and then you're going to say, what elections do I want to do? Because if you don't do it this way, you don't know how much stuff you have to elect on. So intuitively, you need to go through this process and say, what does my tax return look like based on what the rules say I have to do? And then you're going to say, okay, here's an election for the maximum one, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, and then here's the optimal election under normal conditions. Okay? So you got to go through the process of doing that. Okay, so Ren, what do you got? So you got taxable capital gains of how much? We have no we have no gains this year, right? Before any elections, we have the goose egg, right? Okay, and what about what else, Ren? And then we have a capital loss. Okay. I'm just gonna do in thousands, okay guys? Hang on, so what are you going to do, Ren? You're going to add those up? Oh, uh, yeah, we add those. Sorry, you those. Remember, 3B cannot be negative. So 0 minus 2 is minus 2. But remember, 3B says the amount, if any. Therefore, it has to be a positive number. That's a 0. OK? Everybody agree? So this is where, remember last class we talked about, as soon as you see this happening, Zero, where zero basically takes over a number that's negative, what, what did I say we do? What do we do with that? Okay, so we have, we have a number that should be negative something, but the axis, no, zero. What, what, what do we have to do in the order of stuff here? Can you remember what happens? What's your trigger? What does that do? Can we tear it more than the triggers? What that means is you have a loss that you can't use. Therefore, you want to put that in a pool somewhere. Would you agree? So this is the way I, I always do it. It's the way you're, gonna, you're not going to make mistakes. As soon as that happens, look at 0 minus 2 is 0. Ooh, look, if they said I couldn't take a loss, they, they, generally speaking, losses, they're going to give you some relief somewhere else. You need to put it somewhere else. So what you normally do is you go down below, and you're going to say your net. Oh, crap, what happened there? Huh. That's the wrong class. So that's not good. Hang on. 12, 13, all right. How did that happen? Anybody know what happened there? This sucks. <laughs> I'm glad that's on screen, by the way. Hang on here. Uh, class 14. Where'd it go? Uh, and up here. See if I pull, oh, look at me, look at me. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna try not to touch whatever I touch there. So you're gonna have something here, net capital loss pool, right? So by virtue of the fact that we had this little override that was zero, what I would automatically do is say, okay, do we have an opening balance of a net capital losses, right?
We do, right? Do we have loss? Do we have uh, not net capital loss carry forwards? Uh, yeah. We do. How much? Uh, it's Twenty-four, right? Twelve thousand dollars. Oh yeah, right. Twenty-four. That those are those are those are uh, capital losses. So you have to do. Okay, twenty-four times one half <laughs> is twelve. Bless you. Okay. So remember, these are all capital losses. So the net capital losses in all those years, the inclusion rates are half. So you can just do 24 times a half. So your net capital loss carry forward pool is 12. Now what, what I'm saying here is add for short year end or deemed year end to um, balance. Okay. So remember, no election. So there's no election. What's, what, what's this, this balance net capital cap, cap, net, net capital loss of 14? What are you going to say now? What are you going to say now? There's 14,000. So there's no elections. What does the act say? You're going to get a mark for saying something. Which is? It's going to expire. It's going to expire. So you're going to put something like this will expire without any election. Okay? Everybody good? So again, this is the process. If you go through this, it's a lot easier than trying to go through a lot of different what's going on. My, my thought process is to go through your, like, your final the tax return, put all the information there, and what you're going to do now is use this later on for doing elections. Everybody good? Okay, so we got 3B. Okay, Ren, thank you. I picked on you enough, I guess, right? I'm gonna keep going or you wanna let go? You're good? Howard. Where? Eric, Howard, what are you gonna do now? Okay, which is? Even if you didn't do it this way, what's 3C? Were you here the other day? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, I picked your video. Did yeah. I pick your last name? Yeah, I picked your last Oh, good for you. Lucky you. Go get a lottery yeah. ticket. Um, isn't it just 3A? Yeah. Like, isn't it just 3A? Correct. So 3C is basically this plus this minus any subdivision E deductions, which for corporations are generally nothing. Right? Remember, what are subdivision E deductions? They're for people. Generally speaking, what are they? Moving expenses, uh, childcare expenses, RSPs, all that sort of stuff, right? Anything from section 60 to 66, okay? So in this case, it's basically, there are none of those. So basically, it's the sum of zero and zero is, Howard, I'll let you do that one. Good. Now we're gonna do 3D less, what do we take out? What's 3D, guys? Remember we did the other day? No. Yep. Okay. So losses from non capital sources. So remember, this plus. So those are the positive amounts. D is the minus amounts. And they just throw in for good measure something else, Elaine. What's the other thing they throw in there? Uh, Ables. Okay. And I spent 10 minutes on Ables last class, so if you weren't here, go listen to the lecture. It'll talk about what the Ables are. Okay. So, Elaine, what are you going to do here? Uh, so, you look at what sort of losses are found on sources, okay. so that includes the Okay. So, what are you, you going to do here? Sorry? Okay, so you're going to go, sorry? So you had the business loss so far, so they told us? So the one that they told us is 10,000. Um, that's 
So they told us here, the business lost ten thousand dollars up to the end of the, the to the deemed year end. Okay, okay. And then what are you gonna do, Elaine? Okay. So that would be the fair market value, that's $36,000, which is $7,000 less $36,000, which is... Which is how much was it? Equipment was here. Fair market value is 70, UCC is 86. So you got 86 minus 70? Yeah. Right? So 86 minus 70. I did that the wrong way, didn't I? Should be UCC minus fair market value. Equipment. Is that right? Okay. So remember, the equipment here. What you're going to do is you're going to look at fair market. You're going to go to this column. You're going to look and say fair market value, where this is less than that. You've got to recognize the loss, right? So we give you a chart like this, or you you look at your business. You're going to say, okay, 65 versus 85. So 65 is less than or greater than cost. That's going to be bad, so therefore you're going to have to recognize this. This is this is greater than that. That's the, you don't have a you don't have a required inclusion. 75 is greater than uh, 45. No inclusion. 70 is less than 86. That's bad. You got to include it, right, Elaine? So we have basically the equipment, which was 16, and then the inventory, which was 85 minus 65. Okay, so this is equipment deemed CCA, right? So all the government's saying is because the CCA or the UCC is lower than fair market value and acquisition and control, you need to take that down to fair market value. So again, you get a chart like this, you're going to look and say whenever fair market value is less than your cost amount, you're going to basically realize that loss. Everybody good? Andrew? So the equipment in this case would be considered it is capital property, but it doesn't matter. It's, you've got to realize the loss. So for everything you feel like. Okay. Anything there's a lot, when fair market value is less than the cost amount, you've got to recognize it. Don't care if it's capital or not. So inventory, everything else. It's only when you get to the election that you're going to talk about is a capital property with a crude game. That will be something you can pick the fruit off the tree and use that in your elections. Okay. So in this case, you're just going to look and say fair market value less than the cost amount. That's something you're going to have to realize, and that's what we've done here. So anything else, Elaine? Uh, so that would be if so we had any choice would be if the business loss included, so that So you have a business loss of forty six. Yes. Okay? Everybody agree? Right? So it's a negative amount, so you're gonna put a bracket around it. And then what else, Elaine? Everybody get it? Okay. Take a look what happened here. <coughs> Zero minus 46 minus 5.5. Remember we talked about the other day, 3E says where the amount's positive, that's the number. 3F says if it's negative, what happens? So you, you always remember this now, it's a big zero, right? So because the summation of those numbers is negative, it's deemed to be zero. When I say that, D to be zero, somebody's going to tell me something. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? I just said it three, three minutes ago. Okay. Your request, sorry. Don't go to the expiry yet. Before you go there, generally. They've taken a number that was negative and made it zero. That means you're going to go back and say, okay, what is that loss carry forward? What do we do with it? Right? There's a method to the madness. If you get into the habit, trust me, you won't make mistakes. Okay? So because this, they basically said this is a loss that we're, we're not getting, we're basically deeming the income to be zero. Therefore, you should go back and now determine the non-capital loss. Okay? Just like we did here. Remember we just did this with the, the, the net capital loss here? We're doing the same thing. Okay?
Okay, so opening or belt, sorry. Right, so balance forward, what did they give us? This plus this plus this, right, 125? Okay, they told us we came into the year with $125,000 of lost carry forwards. All business. Okay, why did I write that? Why did I write all business there? Why did I write all business there? <coughs> The loss carry forward, and I wrote in brackets all business. Why did I do that? Okay, so it's not profit. property loss, right? Remember, if it's business, and guess what? When you read the question, we're giving you the answer if you, if you know what you're looking for. There's a reason why this is here. I can't see it, that's why. Look what they put here. Non-capital losses. What do they put in brackets? Business. That should tell you there's a reason why they put business there. I mean, we're, we're not trying to waste ink. It's there for a reason. It's basically, you don't need to worry about are these property or not. They're telling you the business loss. Okay? So balance forward is 125. Okay? How do I determine my non-capital loss for this year? Well, we know the balance forward. We've, filed the we've, we've done the tax return. We know it's a negative. So there should be a, a, a non-capital loss calculation. Uh, Ann. Ann too? Yeah, Jack. Jack. Should that not be 30? I don't know. Is that, did I add it wrong? Yes. It's entirely possible. 60. Yep. 1670, 130. Yep. Thanks, Jack. So 130. So I was all excited about the business versus not, and I can't add. Okay, so who's gonna help me? Oh, I said uh, I said Anne, didn't I? Anne? Yes. You ready to go? Not quite ready. Okay, what what do you what do you think you're gonna do? Were you here last day? No. Were you here last class? Not All right, last class. I'll pick you next, okay? okay? I'll let you go on this one because this this is probably not how you did the solution. Okay? Who uh okay, up for grabs, let's just go random. Yeah, Janish. Um yeah, for like both elections. Yeah. Don't do elections yet. We're still doing the return without elections. Okay. Uh huh. Uh, so I guess how do you yeah, determine the non-capital loss carry forward? Uh, the, the non-capital. Yes. Uh, so the one one thirty, and then uh, the, the, the 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 losses that we have the forty. Uh, yeah, the thirty-six. So you're gonna basically remember what I said last day, and if again you weren't here, you should listen to the lecture because it's important. When you're determining the loss. All they've done, all they do is basically, remember we said here, this would be a negative number. They said, let's make it positive. So all they do is they flip the, the equation. So what you're going to do is this goes to the top. This stuff goes to the bottom. That's all it is. Okay? So basically, where this stuff is negative now, it's going to, because we're, what we're going to do now is we're going to flip it. We're going to say, guess what happens? Your loss, cal your loss, carry for your loss calculation. So loss, non-cap, loss, in the year, you're basically going to start with the, yeah, the business, the, 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 all the business losses, which are added up to 46. Losses from business was how much? 46. Yep. Um, and then property loss? Yep. Which was the other 5,500. Yep. Um, so I'm going to put it underlined here, okay? So you're going to add those, you're going to go to 51.5. And what are you going to take from that? Uh, Sorry, uh, I can't write. Recapture? Nope. Recapture. What do you think you're going to add? What are you going to subtract from that? Somebody other than Jennifer? Jennifer was here the other day, by the way. It makes it a lot easier when, you, when you're here to do this stuff. OK, Janesh? Uh, do you want to guess? OK, Jennifer, what do I got to add? Remember what I said? They're just flipping it, right? What happens here? This was the top. This was the bottom as a negative. It's now the top as a neg as a positive. And what was at the pot at the top as a positive goes back as a negative. Oh, we flip signs, right? Because the loss has to be a positive amount. So what we're going to do is three C is how much? Zero. Right? 
So our total loss carry forward is 181.5. Everybody agree? Everybody agree? Okay, so the whole action, lost carry forward is that. And, um, what? Yeah. No election, but property loss gets denied. So now I'm going to come back and say less denied property loss <coughs> carry forward, which is 5.5, is 176. So you guys get? Okay? So again, this is why you show the work this way, because you're getting all your marks along the way. You're now showing the marker that you know the property loss disappears. Right. Are we good? It gets less painful in a second, because what we'll do is, is uh, and I promise we'll scratch over the other station, because we all know that happened last time. Right? Yeah. Oh. So, like on the session, I only do a question. Yes. We calculate the fees of the income with no election. And then when we, when we start to you should do okay remember what I'm doing is I'm going through the solution in a much more lengthy way right okay what this what this does is shows you the tax return um, as though we are final like this if you've got a, a question in an exam you're not going to have all of this in one place right you're not, we're not going to ask you to spend two hours doing this question right so there'll be bits and pieces right you'll see the problem that you'll see on Thursday Guess what we do? We ask you to calculate certain things within the election as opposed to, you know what, all the stuff we take in the course, I'm not going to ask you to spend two hours doing one type of question. You screw it up, you're cooked, and, and it's not good. Right? So that's not good. Right? So we'll try, to, we'll try to pick and choose spots. This just shows you the whole process. Right? And when you're studying, you say, okay, now I get it. So this basically shows you everything you need to do if there were no elections. Okay? Everybody good? Everybody agree? So basically, it's $176,000 lost to non capital loss carry for what you're going to say, what about those lost carry forwards? We're going to go through the what we talked about with Katie. Remember, Katie? What are you going to say now? So we've already said the net capital losses expire, right, Katie? Yeah, so the non-capital loss is similar business. Okay. Again, so the non-capital loss is against to be applied only against income post acquisition of control of same or similar business, right? So those loss carry forwards can only be applied against this income from the business or similar businesses, okay? Agree? Are we done? <coughs> no. Still have to say provided, I'm gonna have to make a proviso. What else are you gonna say? If you can do this, Provided, what? What were the other two provisos we talked about? We kind of, I kind of put this before the, the cart before the horse in this one. Janice. There's an expectation of profit. Okay, so A, the loss, the business that generated the loss is carried on throughout the year where, sorry, when the loss is to be applied and, how do you know what I'm gonna do, I put it here. And, let's be, Jennifer. Lost business was carried on throughout that year with a reasonable expectation of profit. 
Okay, so you're gonna you're gonna put that there basically as the, the proviso as to using those losses. Yeah, Jennifer. Um, just like, so like if I'm mentioning asking this for like tax consequences, then you would expect us to about that. Well, because otherwise how do you explain something that happens with loss? Right? Okay. So you have to have those provisos. So the way I look at it is you tell them about the loss, certain ones expire, certain ones you carry forward, what are the rules about carrying forward? There's no rocket science, guys. It's just basically A follows B follows C. That way you're not jumping all over the place. Okay, everybody agree? What's the last, the last piece of the puzzle going forward? I'll go, it'll be a lot faster in a minute when we get to the, uh, the elections and stuff. What's the last piece of the puzzle? So we've now determined that we filed the tax returns, right? Filed the tax return, determined the loss, said what the loss carry forwards are, what the conditions were on the net capital loss, which are buckets, so you don't get them. Proper loss, buckets, don't get them. Third one is non capital losses, we just put the condition. What's the last piece of the puzzle? What's, what do you need to go forward? What's the last piece? So again, now that's in the rearview mirror. This is going forward. There's one other piece of the puzzle about going forward. What, do you, what would you say? Anybody remember? Sherry? Sure. You're going to basically state the cost base of the assets going forward, right? The assets that we basically just said we took right down the line, somewhere you just need to say, here's the new cost base of the assets. Okay? So, good. There's logic, right? Get the old, do the do the administration, do the tax return of the current year, then look at what we need going forward, right? And then this logical process happens. So the last piece of the puzzle is cost. Um, what did I do? This is B or C. What are we here? B up here. So this will be C. So C is what? This is big C, not little C. This will be a, a state cost base of assets deemed sold at fair market value, right? So you're just basically going to say, guess what you're going to say? What do we, what do we dispose of? So basically, uh, the inventory, in, inventory, cost equals 65, right? The land we didn't touch, so it's going to stay land ACB stays at 155. Remember, we haven't done an election. The building, you can just, you can just say no change in uh, UCC or capital cost if you want to be really smarty pants, or ACB. And the last one is bakery, equipment. Oh, what, what's the bakery equipment? What are you going to tell me? What are the? So you want to tell me what, what, what the tax bases are, are for the bakery equipment? What are you going to tell me? Okay, what's your what's your capital cost and your uh, um, ACB for the bakery equipment now? Seventy, right? Um, ACB equals right. Remember, what we've done is we've taken everything down to seventy thousand UCC, right? So basically, we've been reset to seventy thousand. Right? Everybody agree? Okay? Yeah? Do you do anything like the capital? capital? No, we're not doing the election yet. Oh. This is just, this is the asset that we had to write down. So remember the, the act says there's the crew loss. Samantha, can you read that okay? Can you read it okay? Are you having a problem reading something? Okay. Sorry, I should say Baker Equipment, UCC equals capital cost equals ACB, all equal seven. Basically, all they've done is we need to sell it at fair market value. So everything's reset. Okay? That's it. So that is the tax return with no elections. Okay, that's, that's the, the gist of the problem. Now what we're going to do is say, okay, max elections, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll whiz through this real quick. So now we're going to say, 
uh, maximum election under 111.4e. Okay? Okay, somebody want to help me? What, what's the maximum election under 111.4e? How do we determine that? What is that? So we already know the inventory's been written down. We already know the bakery equipment's been written down. Everybody agree? Okay, so we only have two assets left, land and building. Everybody okay with that? They both have accrued gains. Therefore, and they're both capital property. They have accrued gain on a capital property. They are both eligible for 111, 111E election. Everybody agree? So bake, uh, what do we call this, building? and land both have accrued gains and are capital property. Therefore, eligible for 111 for E election. Okay? So basically you're saying us, telling us it's a crude gain and it's a capital property, therefore they're eligible for 11148. Okay? Okay, what's gonna happen here? Somebody wanna help me real quickly? Sure. So we're gonna do the maximum, right? So land at maximum election. Therefore, disposed of at fair market value. So, how are you going to treat that, Sherry? Um, so, it's 195 So, you're deemed 195, right? So, your D proceeds of disposition is 195. Your ACB, which they told us here, is 155. You have a capital gain of 40, taxable capital gain of 20, right? At one half. Okay? Everybody good? Okay, Sherry, what are you going to do with the building? Um, oh, hang on, let's real quickly, Sherry. You might as well while you're here, right? So this D and P of D, also you can just put in brackets, equals ACB of land in future. Might as well pick up an easy mark, right? Right? So I've already taken care of the future part of it already. Might as well, you're sitting there, you might as well do it. Instead of writing another sentence somewhere else. So the DMP of D of 195 also equals the ACB of the land for the future. Okay? Sherry, what else? Okay, so hang on. So you got the building, you got a UCC of 45. You got the cost of 65, you got a fair market value of 75. Okay? So what are you going to elect at? The maximum election is fair market value, right? So the maximum election on the building is 75. Remember this? Maximum election is 75. So you're, so Sherry, what do you do? Seventy-five, ACB, sixty-five, capital gain ten, taxable capital gain at one half is five. Okay. Equals. You're going to just put here ACB of building for future. Okay. Done with the land share? Are they done with the building? Remember, it's a depreciable property that's sold for more than what you paid for it. You have two things to do. You have to do your capital gain, but you also have to, there's a day of reckoning for all of the CCA you took, that you should not take it. Right? So, we're going to do UCC open takes a little bit longer but I you know you could you could do it in brackets and do a calculation real quick or you can do it 
I mean, I always think it's easier just to go UCC open, less proceeds, which are, or sorry, I should say disposals. Let, I don't know what happened there. There you go. It's okay, you can go away too. Okay. Less disposals. Lower cost and proceeds, right? Capital cost is how much? Sixty-five. And proceeds are deemed to be uh, seventy-five. That says deemed, by the way. Sorry, Here, I'll do that again. Deemed. The lesser of those is sixty-five. See a recapture. UCC before CCA recapture. 20, zero. Okay? So remember, all I'm doing is showing you the, the, the way you do the CCA pool. If you're comfortable saying uh, proceeds of 65 months of UCC of 45 is recaptured 20, you can do that. But this is my way of just making sure you're always remembering you have to do the open minus the quote, minus disposal, disposals and all that stuff. So we now have a recapture of 20, right? Capital gain of 5, taxable capital gain of 20. Okay? Does everybody agree? So by doing this election, okay, so we set the ACB as this much. The last, if you want to get that 98th or 99th mark, what's, what, what's the one piece of the puzzle that we didn't put here? We know. What's the last one, remember? What happens when you have a capital gain and it's a sale to yourself or to a related party? Remember what happens is they limit the amount that you can put into the UCC for the opening for the new asset. So remember we said the ACB of the buildings here is 75. What's the capital cost for the building? Capital cost for building for CCA. But remember? What happens? Remember what happens? Old capital cost equals 65 plus one half capital gain, which was one half of 10, is five, seven, right? So what you're gonna put in your CCA pool isn't 75, it's 70, right? Because you didn't pay tax on half of that amount. So they're not gonna let you take CCA half. So again, if you don't get that mark, that's probably the, seven, the 98 to 99 percentile. Don't bust too much, okay? You got the most of what you need, okay? So we've done the election, what's, what's going to happen? Do we have to go back and restate what our non-capital loss carry forward is now? So what I'm going to do is, so revise tax return using maximum election. Okay? Everybody agree? All we're going to do now is we're going to do that 3A stuff again, right? So what we're going to do here is, remember what we did up here? This stuff? We need to redo that, okay? Because this is like a separate tax return now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to whip through it because we've got five minutes, so I'll do this one. And then in the last class, I will post, uh, at the end of this, I will post the last class, the the uh, optimal election, and that way you have the whole solution in one place, okay? So let's make sure we got this, okay? So basically, we need to now go back and say, okay, now let's do our revised tax return. So 3A, income from positive sources. Is there any, is there any income still? Or what we have to do is, what was our loss from property was 5.5, .5. our business loss, Okay, remember this 46 is now what? It's our business loss now. Remember what that's going to be? Loss was 46 before election. Impact 
of election was what? What happened when we did the election? Did it, did it have an impact on our business loss? Yeah, Sherry? So the recapture reduced the loss from the business. We now have a business loss of 26. Still a loss, so we don't have a positive amount here anyway. So it's still zero. 3B, taxable capital gains. So we had, um, I have no idea what that line is, but that's okay. Okay, taxable capital gains. Before we had zero. Do we have any now? How much do we have now? We have five. Okay, let's do this. And 20, right? So we have 25,000 now of uh, cap taxable capital gains that we didn't have before. So 25, we had allowable capital loss before of two. I believe two is right. And we're just redoing this now with the election, guys. Oh, where is that here, sorry. Here, right, we had allowable capital loss of 2,000. We're carrying that back down. Twenty-three, right? So that's a plus now. So three C is twenty-three. Our losses from business was how much? Twenty-six. Our property losses were five point five. So that's thirty-one point five. So it's still negative. So it's deemed to be zero. So our net income for tax is still deemed to be zero. Okay, everybody agree? So we're still deemed to be zero. Okay? What happens if automatically when I said that? What happens when I said that? It's deemed to be zero. You're gonna do what? You're gonna redo your non-capital loss carry forward, right? So we're gonna do the same thing we did back here. Revised non capital loss current year, right? So you're going to take what, it, what was at the bottom, goes to the top. So property loss 5.5, business loss, the new number is 26, right? So you have 31.5, now you're gonna less 3C, which was up here, 23. Revised non-capital loss, 8.5. Okay, so let's just make sure we have this. So we had, oh sorry, 23 was 3C. You had losses of 31.5, which was 23, what was 23? Here, 8.5, okay? Is that right? Is that right? Katie, why? Okay, so we're gonna do that in a second. But there's a there's something you what well, we talked about last day again. Make sure you see the lecture. Look what happened here was. We basically had a taxable capital gain here, right? That we don't we don't want to lose. So what we want to do is go back, and this the reason I want to show you this, is look what happens here. You basically have to add to the property losses, you have to add. Um, what do you call it here? What do we call it? Uh, net cap, net capital loss claim, right? Because remember, we have loss net capital loss carry forwards way up the top. Where were they here? Twelve, right? We want to use those. They're going to disappear. Everybody agree? We want to use those. So if we were, if we didn't have, you got to make sure you go through the lecture the other day. If we didn't have a negative here, we would go through and calculate a deficiency deduction for the losses. 
We have a, we have a negative, so what the, the act lets us do is, in determining a non-capital loss, they actually let us put that 12 here. So we actually increase our non-capital loss with the amount of the, about amount of the net capital loss we would have claimed. Okay, everybody understand that? Okay, the key here is that 12, if we didn't have, if we had positive income from tax, we would deduct the 12,000 because we had capital losses, very poor, and we had taxable capital gain. We did. So the act to be fair says, you know what, if you want to, what you can do is you can actually take those losses, net capital losses, put them in your non capital loss pool. Right? Everybody get that? Very important here. So what happens here, so instead of this being 31.5, this becomes uh, 38, 43.5. Your non-capital loss is now 20.5 for the year. Okay? Make sure you understand what I did there with that 12. Want me to walk through it again? Want me to walk through it again? Okay. Remember, let's do our, our situation here. Take a look here. We had $23,000 of capital, taxable capital gains. Everybody agree? The claim, and we had a loss carry forward of $12,000 of net capital losses. Remember that 24, these numbers here? Here, remember here? Those are capital losses we have. Take half, inclusion rate. We have $12,000 of net capital losses that we're gonna lose. We don't wanna lose them, so what happens? We want to regenerate them. So what we're allowed to do is, what I did here was, normally what we would do is we'd come down here and we'd say, oh, we have taxable capital gains of 23. We have $12,000 of net capital loss carry for us we want to use. No problem, we can deduct them. The problem is we're already at zero. For net income, you can't take any division C deductions from a zero. So what happens is, and remember, as soon as we see this, we go down and calculate the, the, the non-capital loss here. And what the rules in 111.4e, or 111.8, sorry, 111.8, if you want to see, if you want to take a read if you're doing nothing tonight, 111.8, what that says is you can actually take the loss that you otherwise would have taken if you didn't have a negative, or a negative, uh, business, uh, a negative operating income and, and you're generating through here. So look what happened here. All we've done is basically taken that $12,000 deduction after all. Where we, where we couldn't because there was no division of the income, they're saying you can add that into your pool of losses. And remember, the other one like that is dividends. So you're allowed to do that with dividends as well. So now we put it into the pool, along with the, the, non, the property loss and the business loss, we come with the total negatives, and then add back the positive number, which is 23, yet revise on capital loss of 20.5. Okay? Okay, how Try to understand it, go through the lecture, but as well, it's in the book that shows you how to do this as well. But that's, that's fundamentally that part is, is you generate a net capital loss this way. Okay? I will make sure the second part of my next lecture, I will make sure that I post the, the last part, which is the optimal lecture. Okay? So you have the full solution. All right?